As you see, uh, the next 45 minutes uh, are going to be two topics that you're not exactly household words here, cellular biology and immunology. I'm not a cell biologist, I'm not an immunologist, but I hope that my naivete about some of these deep areas uh, well, gave me the ability to sort of step back and look at them and um, uh, try to sift through what I think might be important for the pulmonologist to know and especially for a board review. So that's going to be the next 45 minutes. Um, I just do want to clarify a couple things. Dr. Bolter asked me to maybe just make a mention. One of the questions that I asked, maybe there was some confusion about, the question about what prevents exacerbations. And one of the answers was, uh, the right answer actually was oral corticosteroid doesn't, doesn't do that. Uh, that's chronic oral, oral corticosteroids. So if you know, taking it at uh, 10 or 15 whatever milligrams a day, uh, it would not be the answer. Obviously, it's important for the acute exacerbation, preventing acute exacerbations. Uh, the other thing was the influenza story. Uh, I showed you a meta-analysis that was a little older from the Archives of Internal Medicine. That's a kind of a controversial issue, and most recommendations are, well, to give it, but not to prevent exacerbations. Uh, the um, slide that I did show you was the pneumonia slide, and even, uh, oh, oh, I'm sorry, pneumococcal um, uh, prevention was one of the questions. And uh, it's not recommended for preventing exacerbations. What, uh, what I showed you was the pneumonia slide, which sort of uh, showed that in some groups, yes, it does. Uh, we would not, not give it, but in terms of the answer to a question of, uh, on the boards, uh, I would not put that, put that down, pneumococcal, uh, for prevention of exacerbations. So let's get to this now topic. No disclosures. Here are some objectives. Uh, you can read them. I, obviously, in the interest of time, we'll not go over them. So there are questions on the boards uh, about cellular and molecular biology, immunology, about 3.5%. Uh, about six to nine questions in recent years on this, these topics. So my assignment, which I fell over when I saw it, was to talk about uh, topics like apoptosis, cell adhesion, cell function, metabolism, cell signaling, cytokines, extracellular matrix, growth factors, molecular biology, and oxidants. This is from the ABIAM's list of the things that you should know, that you should be sort of familiar with. Well, I looked at this and I went, oh my gosh, what are we gonna do here? And I realized that the beginning of wisdom is at least to call things by the right names. And what I'd like to do is talk about these topics and sort of give you some sense of what they are and what sort of the main, main points are. And uh, hopefully then you'll be able to call these things by their right names. So let's first talk about cell structure and function. These are names from high school and college biology. Uh, the cell membrane, the interface of the cell wall with its environment, impermeable to ions, most water and soluble molecules, has a transmembrane channels and pumps. We just heard about Dr. Moore has just talked about this in, in CF. That's the plasma membrane. The nucleus stores genetic information in long DNA molecules we call chromosomes uh, with N regions called telomeres. Uh, telomere is something we're going to talk a little bit about. These telomeres stabilize chromosomes and actually prevent them from linking together. Uh, and they ensure the proper distribution of daughter cells when cells divide. The cytosol is the aqueous environment of the cytoplasm and major functions to synthesize proteins uh, both for its own use in the cell and for import into, uh, into organelles. So let's take a minute about telomeres. This has really gotten hot in the, in the literature lately. The repetitive DNA sequences associated with also some proteins that at the ends of these linear chromosomes, so they're both ends of these chromosomes, they have these, these segments called telomeres. They protect the DNA ends from shortening. And uh, the uh, reason that they can do so is by these enzymes called telomerases. It's an enzyme complex that generates and maintains telomeres. So each cell division, your telomere actually shortens a little bit, but because we have telomerase, not very much of it in somatic cells, more in, uh, in uh, uh, stem cells and, and uh, uh, rapidly producing cells, epithelial cells, um, uh, and uh, uh, the um, telomerase uh, can actually reproduce some of these telomeres and therefore prevent uh, shortening. Um, there are two kinds of these telomerases. You may see reference to them, the reverse transcriptase or TERT, uh, 
and the RNA template telomerase RNA component, Turk. Uh, so cells have these ends, the, tel the, the telomerase ends, the telomere ends, and the repetitive cell divisions cause shortening. The telomerase prevents the shortening, but the sad news is over time, they get shorter and shorter. And this really leads, this is what we call aging, and this leads to uh, senescence, which we'll discuss the definition of in a minute. Over time, the telomerase is shortened, eventually triggering the senescence and apoptosis, another word we'll discuss. Now, why is this so exciting? Because actually, telomerase deficiencies has been associated with certain disease states. Specific mutations, for example, in the telomerase components of TERT and TERC result in IPF. About 15% of the familial IPF actually has these uh, uh, specific mutations. Even about 5% of typical uh, uh, IPF will have these mutations. So there is some relationship to uh, telomerase sh shortening and deficiencies uh, of the telomere, uh, t deficiencies of the telomerase, shortening of the telomeres, and IPF. COPD. Actually, there's some recent evidence that shortening of the telomeres is seen in the COPD patients compared to controls. What this means, what this is, we, uh, we don't really know, but certainly uh, it's part of the aging process and part of maybe the aging uh, uh, of, of uh, cells in COPD. So that's what a telomer is. The actin cytoskeleton, these are a network of fibrous elements. They consist of microtubules and actin microfilaments in, in the cell. Uh, and they're found in the cytoplasm. Uh, the uh, cytoskeleton provides structural support for the cell. It's like a scaffolding, uh, seen by this little cartoon. This little, actually, it's not cartoon. It's a, it's a photomicrograph picture uh, of the filaments in the epithelial cells. So it sort of establishes the shape of the cell. It provides mechanical strength to the cell. Actually, it sort of helps in the locomotion. Obviously, many cells, like white cells, they migrate, uh, and it can help in that. Uh, it helps in, this, in the separation of, uh, of the cells and, and uh, uh, replication, like mitosis or meiosis, and also helps in intracellular transport uh, of organelles. The replication of cells is regulated by growth factors. We'll discuss the more of that uh, from a structural link between the extracellular matrix and this cytoskeleton, the actin cytoskeleton. So growth factors are going to act toward the cell uh, and the connection between the outside of the cell, the extracellular matrix, inside, uh, is done uh, through these growth factors. There are specialized adhesive structures. These are called focal adhesions, and they provide this structural link. So these uh, uh, growth factors, for example, will go to the cell and attach to the focal adhesion, and this will then cause action within the cell. To achieve DNA replication and division, the cell goes through a tightly controlled sequence of events known as, from, from college biology, the cell cycle, which we'll talk about next. Again, one of the topics suggested by the, uh, for, the, for the board review. So here you see the various stages of the cell replication. The G0 state, the quiescent state, where they have not entered into the cell cycle yet. And this is probably the longest period where, where cells are. They're usually in a quiescent phase. Then there's the presynetic, the DNA synthesis part of it, the pre-mitotic, and then the cell division my, my, uh, uh, mitosis uh, phase, the somatic cells. So each cell cycle phase is dependent on proper activation and completion of the previous phase. The cycle stops at a place where something goes wrong. Let's say there's a, there's a gene malfunction, or there's a deficiency in, in, in the gene that's replicated. There are multiple controls and redundancies, particularly during the transition between the G1 and S phases that we'll discuss. The transition from the G0, remember that, uh, that quiescent uh, sleeping phase, to G1 is the first decision step that a cell has, which functions as a gateway to the cell division. This transition involves certain transcriptional activation, with a large set of genes, the cells in G1 progress through the cycle and reach a critical stage at the next transition point, the G1S transition, known as a restriction point. So the cell cycle has these stops, and its first one is this trans uh, restriction point. This is regulated by various proteins within the cell called cyclins and their inhibitors. Some growth factors actually shut off production of these inhibitors, allowing cell growth. <coughs> 
There's a, also quality control checkpoints, uh, quality control checks called checkpoints. They ensure that the cells with damaged DNA or chromosomes don't enter this replication phase. The, GS, the G1S checkpoint monitors the integrity of DNA before replication, whereas the DG2M checkpoint checks DNA after replication and monitors whether the cell can safely enter division or mitosis. So if the DNA damage is too severe to be repaired, the cells are eliminated and die by apoptosis. Or they may enter a non-replicative state called senescence. So you have the cell replication model going on. If there is something that goes wrong in the, in the, in the chromosomes, bam, something stops, and the cells will then either die or go into this period of senescence. Checkpoints control transitions between cell cycle stages. They are biochemical circuits that detect external or internal problems in the cell division, and they send these inhibitory signals. Now, defects in the checkpoint function allow cells with DNA strand breaks or some of the chromosome abnormalities that divide that produce mutations in daughter cells that may lead to neoplasia. So this is one of the ways that we can, again, prevent these abnormal cells from duplicating, duplicating, causing cancer. And this is just a, a cartoon uh, which sort of reiterates the sort of what I say, starting with the G1 uh, a, a phase here. Uh, there's a growth in this, in this phase here. Um, centrum duplication, or the restriction point that I mentioned, the checkpoint that I mentioned, going on eventually to the mitosis. Again, another checkpoint here, uh, the G2M checkpoint, preventing this cell division uh, if there is indeed something wrong with the, with, the, with the DNA, and eventually then going on to the cell division. So some of these cells are very active. I mean, the, uh, for example, um, uh, neural cells uh, really don't don't really do much of this. They don't really duplicate at all. Liver cells, less so. Other epithelial cells, a lot of, a lot, uh, of replication. So depending upon uh, uh, the G0 phase, the, the neural cell will, can be in it for a long, long time. The epithelial cell, a relatively short time. So again, the cycle stops at a place which is where an essential gene function is deficient. So now let's talk about growth factors, which I had mentioned define this apoptosis, what is it, senescence, and talk a bit about cell adhesion, other topics that have been recommended. But we'll get to question number one. The proliferation of many cell types is driven by polypeptides known as growth factors. Which of the following growth factor is mitogenic for endothelial cells? Is it FGF? Is it TGF beta? Is it EGF? Is it TGF alpha? Or is it VEGF? Your answer, please. Good, about 44% said the VEGF. Let's talk about each of these growth factors. So the proliferation of many cells is driven by polypeptides. We call them growth factors. They also promote cell survival, locomotion, contractility, differentiation, and also angiogenesis. Growth factors function as ligands, I'll define that in a second, that bind to specific receptors on the cell. They deliver signals to these tar target cells that then causes transcription of genes and eventually cell division, cell growth. So what is EGF, epidermal growth factor, or transforming growth factor alpha, TGF alpha? They belong to this EGF family, the epidermal growth factor family. They share a common receptor, EGFR, which is the receptor. EGF is mitogenic for a variety of epithelial cells, some hepatocytes, and fibroblasts. It's involved in epithelial proliferation and also in malignant transformation of normal cells to cancer. The EGF receptor is actually a family of four membrane receptors with intrinsic cytokine, tyrosine cytokinase activity. I'll describe that in a second. So EGRF mutations and application have been detected in cancers of the lung. You know that. You heard about that earlier. Leading to new types of molecular treatments such as EGRF tyrosine kinase inhibitors. And you've heard about these uh, uh, agents uh, like uh, tafitinib and so forth uh, earlier. So that's what this growth factor does, and uh, it works through these membrane receptors with intrinsic tyrosine kinase activity, and you can block the 
tyrosine kinase inhibitory activity. What's the platelet growth factor? Well, PDGF is stored in the platelet granules, is released on platelet activation. It's produced actually also by a variety of cells, macrophages, endothelial cells, smooth muscle cells. It causes migration and proliferation of fibroblasts, smooth muscle cells, monocytes in areas of inflammation and wound healing. So it's an important growth factor causing proliferation uh, in the, the wound healing process. VEGF. You've got, many of you got that right. The vascular endothelial growth factor is a potent inducer of blood vessel formation and early development, vascular genesis, we call it. It's a central role in growth of new blood vessels, so-called angiogenesis in adults. It promotes angiogenesis and in chronic inflammation, healing, quite important, and unfortunately, in tumors also. Signaling here also is through the, as I mentioned earlier, through the tyrosine kinase receptors located on the endothelial cells as well as other cells. And lastly, there's something called fibroblast growth factor, which contributes to wound healing uh, responses, hematopoiesis, angiogenesis, and other processes. So these are the major growth factors uh, and, and their actions. A number of pro-fibrotic mediators include PG, PGDF and fibroblast growth factor transforming growth factor beta are believed to be play important roles in the pathogenesis of IPF, pulmonary fibrosis. Uh, for example, and nintetinib, which I know you'll hear later about with the IPF story, a potent inhibitor of a receptor tyrosine kinase, that's a PGDF receptor, the FGF receptor, and vascular endothelial growth factor receptor. And therefore, Nintenabab just, just a, a, a approved interferes with these processes in active fibrosis through this, uh, through this receptor. Growth arrest that limits the lifespan of cells and prevents unlimited cell proliferation is called apoptosis, cellular senescence, efferocytosis, or necroptosis. Which do you think it would be? Good, but half of you, 50% cellular senescence. And we'll discuss each of these in a minute. So what's apoptosis? Well, it's an orderly process of cellular self-destruction, a controlled demolition, if you will. And what's important about apoptosis is no inflammatory response. So it's a programmed cell death where you don't get a lot of inflammatory response with it. It's important for immunity, eliminating dangerous cells such as self-antigen, recognizing cells so you don't attack yourself. In tissue remodeling, it eliminates cells no longer needed. It eliminates damaged dysfunctional cells, non-functional cells. It contrasts with ischemic cell death that invokes a major inflammatory response and some collateral damage. Senescence. Cellular senescence is a growth arrest program that limits the lifespan of mammalian cells, prevents unlimited cell proliferation. So a cell gets older, we talked about telomeres, and older and older, and then just stops. It doesn't die, it just stops. It prevents unlimited proliferation. It's a response of normal cells to potentially cancer-causing events. It may be a physiologically important process in humans, keeping cells in a benign state for many years, unchecked so they don't develop into malignancy. The mechanism involves cell divisions that result in a shortening of the telomere region of chromosomes. Cumulative critical length is reached that doesn't support DNA replication machinery, and they st it stops right there. The cell will not divide anymore. Obviously, if it has some of these chromosomal damage, it's important because there's then, then no proliferation to malignancy. So that's cell senescence. Necroptosis is a form of regulated cell death that is potentially more inflammatory than apoptosis. It leads to plasma cell rupture and release of the cell contents. And in a few minutes, we're going to be talking about some receptors, uh, such as toll-like receptors, that can recognize uh, abnormal antigens. We'll mention that in the immunology part of this. But one of the things that, can, that, that is released here is these damage-associated molecular patterns that can be recognized uh, by uh, cell receptors. And intracellular kinase, RIP kinase, is essential for necroptosis. An inhibitor, necrostatin blocks RIP, 
uh, kinase-induced necroptosis and inhibits TNF-alpha-induced necroptosis. So there is an inhibitor for this process, but that's what this is, and, and it leads to a little bit more in terms of a pro-inflammatory state. Efferocytosis, another term. It, in phagocytic leukocytes, predominantly macrophages, uh, not only ingest and destroy invading pathogens, but are charged with clearing dead and dying host cells. You don't want these lying around because then you'll develop antigens to them and this leads to autoimmunity. The process of engulfing apoptotic cells is called efferocytosis, has been long appreciated for its role in resolution of inflammation. Without swift removal uh, via efferocytosis, apoptotic bodies can disintegrate, release their intracellular contents, so therefore, this can be a secondary necrosis process, which then would lead to inflammation. So efferocytosis, helpful in removing these apoptotic cells. What's cell adhesion? Well, there are cell surface adhesion proteins, and they're molecules that glue cells together into multicellular organisms and tissues. They provide the cell with an instrument also to communicate with its surroundings. So examples, muscle cells must adhere firmly to each other and to the connective tissue of tendons and transmit force to the skeleton. Skin cells have to bind tightly together uh, to prevent anything, obviously, from coming across. Um, and uh, uh, the underlying connective tissue uh, uh, must be attached to re resist abrasion. Uh, at sites of inflammation, leukocytes bind transiently to endothelial cells and then via their interactions with extracellular matrix to migrate through connective tissue. Uh, also, an important in the pathologic process, such as tumor cell invasion, hematasis, and thrombosis are these cell adhesion molecules, these proteins. Examples of cell adhesion receptors uh, you may read about. I'm not going to describe all of them. Integrins, cathed cathedrins, uh, there's an I uh, ICAMs, selectins. These are all uh, molecules for cell adhesion. Let's talk a bit about signal transduction. First, a ligand is a molecule that binds to another molecule, usually referring to a smaller molecule binding to a larger molecule, like an antigen binding to an antibody, a hormone or a transmitter binding to a receptor. So this is what a ligand looks like, triggers in the cell a series of events when it binds to its receptor. Extracellular signals are transduced into the cell, resulting in changes in gene expression through signal transduction pathways. The receptors for these are usually on the surface of the cell, but, as we'll see in a moment, may be actually in the cytoplasm or, or the nucleus, and this is true of, uh, for example, hormonal receptors. So the binding of a ligand to its receptor on the target cell triggers, uh, uh, cell surface, triggers a series of signals that are transduced into the cell and result in changes of gene expression. Receptors with intrinsic tyrosine kinase, act kinase activity, which we just heard about, A, produce factors that directly control the entry of the cells into the cell cycle, B, are responsible for hormone production, C, transmit signals into the cell through G proteins, or D, are activated by serotonin, histamine, and epinephrine. What's your guess here? Okay, we'll talk about all this. The right answer is entry into the cell. All right, let's see why. Okay, so here are the major types of cell receptors. Okay, remember, these are gonna be serving, when they get their signal, they're gonna be serving to signal, uh, 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 they're signaling molecules, okay? The receptors on the surface are those with intrinsic tyrosine kinase activity, receptors lacking intrinsic tyrosine kinase activity that recruit kinases, G, G protein couple receptors, and steroid hormone receptors. So these are the four major receptors that we'll discuss. Receptors with intrinsic tyrosine kinase activity include most growth factors, EGF, TGF-alpha, VEGF, et cetera, have extracellular ligand binding domain and a transmembrane region and a cytoplasmic tail that has intrinsic tyrosine kinase activity. So in other words, the, 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 um, uh, for example, an EGF or TGF-alpha comes, binds to the surface of the cell, but also has a, a domain or ac action in the cell, uh, and with the, uh, in, with, it activates the intrinsic tyrosine kinase activity. Binding of the ligand induces tyrosine phosphorylation and activation of the tyrosine kinase. 
This activates downstream effector molecules. One effector molecule that triggers this whole thing is MAP kinase. I'm sure you must have heard about MAP kinase, and that's what is, is being triggered. This stimulates synthesis and phosphorylation of transcription factors, which will then uh, direct the nucleus. So receptors with intrinsic tyrosine kinase, tyrosine kinase activity uh, are activated by various signals that cascading into in turn stimulate the production of growth factors, receptors for growth factors, and certain proteins that directly call, uh, control entry of the cells into the cell cycle. And this is why it's so important, as we talked earlier, in, in cancer uh, uh, treatment, in uh, pulmonary fibrosis, and so forth. Other effector molecules activated by receptors with intrinsic tyrosine kinase activity are involved in cell proliferation and cell survival through inhibition of apoptosis. Alterations in tyrosine kinase activity and receptor mutations have been detected in many forms of cancer and are important targets for therapy, as I had just said. Receptors lacking intrinsic tyro tyrosine kinase activity that recruit kinases, the second receptor, these are li the ligands for these receptors include many of the cytokines, inflammatory cytokines, IL-2, IL-3, interleukins, interferons, uh, alpha, uh, beta, and gamma. These receptors transmit extracellular signals to the nucleus by activating members of another kinase family, the JAK kinase family of proteins. They activate cytoplasmic transcription factors called STATs, the so-called signal transducers and activation of transcription, which directly shuttle into the nucleus and activate gene transcription. G protein couple receptors. These receptors transmit signals into the cell through GTP binding proteins, they're called G protein. It's the largest family of plasma receptors, probably more than 1,000 uh, receptors. A number of ligands signal through this type of receptor, chemokines, vasopressin, serotonin, histamine, epinephrine, norepinephrine, calcitonin, enormous number of pharmaceutical drugs target these receptors. So this is an important target of many of the, uh, the drug actions uh, of the pharmaceuticals that we use. So, I'll give you some examples. A, a, a subunit of G protein coupled receptors links with a variety of effector proteins. Adenylcyclase facilitates conversion of ATP, the prevalent storage energy in the cell, into the second me messenger, cyclic AMP. Uh, phosphodiesterases, enzymes that affect cellular levels of the second messenger, CAMP or CGMP by controlling their rates of degradation. Uh, phospholipase is an enzyme that releases arachidonic acid from membrane uh, uh, phospholipids. And lastly, we have hormone receptors, the steroid hormone receptors. These receptors are generally located in the nucleus, as I had said earlier, and functions as ligand dependence transcription factors. These steroid hormones appear to enter the target cell by simple diffusion into the plasma membrane. They activate rece receptor hormone complex that binds to high affinity receptors, specific DNA sequences called steroid responsive elements, and this then regulates transcription of the target genes. These nuclear receptors are involved in a broad range of responses. They include adipose genesis, inflammation, atherosclerosis. They can be quantified. That's what this is a, a, a breast cancer receptors. Many of the signal transduction systems are used by growth factors, trans, uh, transfer information to the nucleus, and modify gene trans transcription through transcription factors. Okay, so we have signal transduction system through the cell, and then modulate gene transcription. And these factors that are doing this are called transcription factors. So, signal transduction, what is it? It broadly refers to intracellular biochemical responses of cells after binding of these ligands to these receptors. But not all signaling receptors are located on the plasma membrane, as I said. Remember, some of them are in the nucleus. Signaling initiated by these receptors typically involves first a cytosol phase leading to activation of transcription factor uh, that are actually silent in resting cells. The nuclear phase when transcription factors orchestrate changes in gene expression. So it's the proteins that bind to DNA and regulate gene transcription, convert these signals to nuclear messengers, you can call them, and these are some of the nuclear messengers. You've heard about uh, many of these uh, transcription factors, NF-kappa-B, JAK kinase we talked about, uh, NFAT is another one, STATS, GATA, and these are all uh, things that you've, I know, seen in the literature. So there's an mTOR, uh, a mechanistic target of rapamycin pathway, and also part of this complex network of cell signaling. 
It has an outsized role in regulating basic cell behaviors like growth, mass, accumulation, proliferation. The mTOR is a target of a molecule named rapamycin or sirolimus. Sound familiar? That has broad anti-proliferative properties as an inhibitor of mTOR. So mTOR dysregulation has been implicated in a variety of cancers and also LAM, lymphangiolyomimetosis, uh, and a rare multi-system disease in women caused by mTOR proliferation of neoplastic smooth muscle cells, hence the efficacy of sirolimus in LAM treatment has been demonstrated. Transcription is a process of making an RNA copy of gene sequence and messenger RNA. A form of RNA mediates transfer of the genetic information from the cell nucleus to ribosomes, where it serves as a template for protein synthesis in the cytoplasm. It's synthesized from a DNA template during the process called transcription. The ribosome is a large complex of proteins and RNAs that directs synthesis of proteins from the messenger RNA in the process called translation. Cytokines, like growth factors, are signaling molecules that control the activities of cell through this intracellular communication we had mentioned before. They bind to specific receptors on the surface of their target cells, induce intracellular signaling pathways that regulate many of biologic processes. They're secreted by a variety of cells, but these are particularly uh, from the immune system. Cytokines produced by these cells are essential for initiating inflammation and the innate and adaptive immune response. So let's talk about some of these immune mechanisms. The allergic response begins when an inhaled antigen is transported into the airway. What cell is responsible for this process? Again, transfer of an antigen into the airway. Is it the mast cell, the dendritic cell, the T naive T0 lymphocyte, the Th2 lymphocyte, or the macrophage? Your answer, please. Excellent, dendritic cell. So, you recognize that this dendritic cell here is an important link between our innate immune system and our adaptive immune system. Innate immune system including uh, the epithelial barrier itself, the phagocytes such as macrophages, natural killer lymphocytes, uh, and then of course the adaptive immune system involving uh, uh, T lymphocytes, eventually B lymphocytes, antibody production, and the uh, production of effector T cells. Uh, one of the things that uh, occurs in the innate immune response to these cells is that it's not really dependent on antigens. There's an immediate maximum response in the innate immune system. Again, not antigen specific. And really, there's no immunologic memory uh, from these macrophages or NK uh, lymphocytes. The adaptive immunity is responsive to antigen. It's antigen dependent. There is a lag time between exposure and maximum response of days, as not seen in innate, which is immediate. It is antigen specific, and exposure results in immunologic memory in this adaptive system. So, what are these sentinel cells of the lower airway in our uh, uh, in, uh, innate immune system? Uh, the respiratory immune system starts with cells that capture particles that have invaded the airway. These are the pulmonary dendritic cells, where the little pseudopods that, uh, that are capturing these particles right here. The pulmonary macrophages here engulf the, uh, uh, the particles themselves. So phagocytes have a variety of receptors on their surface, which recognize broad molecular patterns. These patterns are called PAMPs, pathogen-associated molecular patterns on agents that are uh, infectious disease. They bind, the binding of infectious disease via these receptors on the cell results in phagocytosis and then the release of certain inflammatory mediators, IL-1, TNF-alpha, IL-6, by these phagocytes. Infected cells and other stress cells also release host cell-derived molecules. These are called damage-associated molecular patterns. So if you had, for example, a, a, an inhalation injury, a burn injury, and cells were dying, okay, they'd be falling off. The receptors in these cells, called DAMPs, would be recognized by these cellular receptors, the toll receptors, and uh, obviously uh, can recognize as, as self and therefore uh, prevent an autoimmune response. Um, so the uh, recognition of these re by these receptors can lead uh, to cell death, inflammation, inhibition of, of inflammation. So here's what uh, 
these receptors look like, these toll receptors. They sit outside the cell. They have a, a, an in, intracellular domain also. Here are the microbes. Uh, they recognize these, these microbes by, by the, uh, uh, the PAMPs uh, and will then act, uh, act accordingly, uh, depending upon what this microbe is. And obviously, the DAMPs here would be a damaged cell, uh, which would be recognized as self. So the um, immature dendritic cell, which, as I said, sits just, be just below the epithelium with its lutopsodopod, captures a particle, okay? As it does so, upon exposure to an antigen, you get signaling through the innate, innate root immune receptors we just talked about, such as the toll-like receptors, and this promotes a maturation of the dendritic cell. Then they can express co-receptors, which we'll discuss in a second, on their surface, and also cytokines that then go in and act, activate T cells. So here's an immature uh, um, uh, immunity cell, the dendritic cell, becoming a mature dendritic cell, then producing these cytokines. So how does this all work? Well, these dendritic cells migrate. They migrate through the pulmonary lymphatic system to the bronchos-associated lymph tissue as well as thoracic lymph nodes. A major histocompatibility complex type 2 molecules on the surface of these antibiogenic cells present the antigenic material to lymphocytes, the so-called T null cells. So what happens is the particles are ingested here. They, they come into the cell. Uh, they are then uh, activated upon and then brought to the surface by these uh, uh, major histocompatibility molecules brought to the surface of the antigen-presenting cell. Antibiogenic cell migrates, and who does it meet? The T cell. So here is the dendritic cell coming through the lymphatic system, and here in the lymph node is a T lymphocyte. Depending upon what that activation is by the dendritic, the dendritic cell, which depends upon what it's, what it's just bringing uh, to the surface here, it will activate through one of two pathways, through, through cytokine release. Either activate the Th1 cell, or the Th2 cell. As you see, Th1 lymphocytes are responsible for cell-mediated immunity, intracellular pathogens. Th2 is the antibody-mediated response and a response to extracellular pathogens. Now, there's one more cell that's sitting over here called the Treg cell. These are T regulatory cells. And this cell here, the Treg cell, actually puts a little bit of a, of a, uh, a stop on excessive uh, activation uh, of, these, of these cells. And actually have re reported to be very important, for example, in, uh, when they go wrong in uh, autoimmune diseases. So the T regulatory cells induce tolerance, the appropriate response to aeroallergens, for example, in the lower airway. They're believed to be induced by antigen presuming cells that have captured non pathogenic antigens. The T reg cells suppress the response of the T cells through inhibitory cytokines, such as TGF beta or an IL-10. And this is a T-reg cell showing uh, its inhibitory cytokines on the effector cell. So Th1 cells produce a certain set of cytokines, uh, interferon gamma, IL-2, TNF-alpha. They are important in obviously cell-mediated immunity to intracellular pathogens, TB, for example, uh, or non-pathogenic uh, uh, stimuli, sarcoidosis, for example. The Th2 cells produce another set of cytokines, interleukin-4, 5, 6, 10, 13, and IL-2. These are predominant in immediate or allergic type hypersensitivity. So here's the Th1 response, Th1 cells with their interferon gamma and TN alpha, uh, involving macrophages and neutrophils. Here is the Th2 response, okay, to extracellular pathogens such as uh, uh, parasites, helminths, certain bacteria and they release a different set of cytokines. Important, IL-4, 5, 13, uh, for this allergic response. How do they act? They act on B cells, which then will produce the uh, uh, IgE antibody if it's allergy, IgG antibody, for example, with pathogens, the neutralizing antigen antibody. Th2 cells also produce a cytokine, interleukin-5, which then recruits from the bone marrow eosinophils, causes maturation, and eosinophilic inflammation. So this is the Th2 pathway. Interleukin-13 is an important mediator of the allergic response. Which of the following is a known consequence of production of IL-13? Differentiation of na naive T cells toward the Th lineage, Th2 lineage. Goblet cell hyperplasia and mucus hypersecretion, 
induction of B-cell isotype switching to produce IgE, or the development of eosinophilia? Your answer. Uh, yep, this is the answer. So, uh, what develops, what's the cytokine for eosinophils? IL-5. Induction of B-cell B produce switching, mainly IL-4. Uh, differentiation of T-cells toward the TH lineage is not uh, anything to do with uh, uh, these, these cytokines. That was a ringer there. So let's talk about it. IL-4 has multiple effects, differentiating of, of uh, T cells toward the TH lineage and induction of B cell isotype switching to produce IgE. This is important. IL-4, IgE. IL-5, I said, eosinophilia. IL-13 is responsible for numerous features of TH2 inflammation, especially in the asthmatic lung, goblet cell hyperplasia, mucus hypersecretion. So all that is cough and mucus plugs that our, our asthmatics have, very much IL-13 driven. Also responsible for bronchial hyperresponsiveness and can alter the phenotype of structural cells in the airway, promoting the expression of pro-inflammatory pro mediators by airway smooth muscle. B cells. Most B cells require help from T cells uh, in the form of co-stimulatory molecules and cytokines to achieve full activation. Following antigen-driven activation and T cell help, B cells differentiate into specialized cells, plasma cells and B memory cells. They're long lived and important secondary immune responses. Plasma cells, what do they produce? High levels of antibodies. So here's the schema. And you can see here the B cells can, can switch the immunoglobulin they produce by local cytokine productions. They can produce IgG, IgA, IgE, IgM, depending upon the stimulus that they get <coughs> and the cytokines that are produced that then will make these, uh, these uh, antibodies. So here's the schema I told you about. Well, it's not that that simple. There are other cells and other cytokines and other populations that as this immunologic uh, investigation is going on, becoming more and more complicated. One of those that's become very pr important and prominent is the Th17, T helper 17 cell. Some populations of CD4 uh, T cells can develop into Th17 cells. So again, depending upon the programming here, the T naive cell can eventually then produce Th17 based on the cytokine uh, in, in the milieu. IL-17 is a cytokine produced by Th17 cells. It may play a role <coughs> in neutrophilic response of the airways. In severe asthma, for example, which encompasses a population of asthmatics poorly controlled by corticosteroids, may have neutrophilic component to the airway inflammation rather than the simple eosinophilic component. Currently, there are actually trials of anti-IL-17 uh, in patients with adequately controlled asthma. Is this another pathway where we can block the inflammatory uh, cascade, which is not a typical uh, allergic uh, um, IL-4, IL-5, IL-13 uh, uh, immunoglobulin pathway? So, finally, what is a respiratory burst? During phagocytosis, mainly these macrophages are gobbling things up, there is increased glucose and oxygen, oxygen consumption. This is caused, called the respiratory burst. The consequence of the respiratory burst is that a number of oxygen-containing oxygen compounds are produced which kill the bacteria being phagocytized. So that's the good news. However, this is referred to oxygen-dependent intracellular killing. But, in addition, the bacteria, there can be preformed substances in the granules or lysosomes uh, that, can, that can occur and they can be actually uh, 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 harmful. This is the oxidative stress. They're good because you have an oxygen dependent and there's also an oxygen independent intracellular killing, but through this process we can release uh, certain uh, uh, oxidative stress and with that I had talked about with the COPD. So that's a lot. I recognize that, but that's, that's what we've been given. Thank you.